Wrestling is weird. Somewhere between sport and pantomime, it occupies a space in the entertainment world that nothing else does. That's why you can have fairly normal characters such as Brian Danielson or Roman Reigns placed alongside far more bizarre ones like The Fiend or The Undertaker and no one will ever really bat an eye. Still, those are far from the weirdest characters that have ever been seen inside the ring. But what are the strangest characters that the WWE has ever came up with? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into some of the wildest of them all in Crazy Characters, Wrestling's Wackiest Gimmicks. We start, perhaps predictably, in early 90s WWE, the place where some of the most bizarre wrestling gimmicks ever thought up lived. Yes, this was the period when, with fan interest at an all-time low following the steroid trial and the loss of many of the 80s biggest stars, Vince McMahon decided to push the idea of wrestlers with jobs. And that was how we got the likes of Abe Knuckleball Schwartz, a baseball player moonlighting as a wrestler who made his debut in 1994. But for as stupid as this was, there was some attempt to try and give logic to it as Schwartz would be portrayed as a player who, struggling to deal with the impending baseball shutdown of that year, was being forced to find employment elsewhere for the time being. As for the man who got the unfortunate job of playing knuckleball, well, he should have been used to portraying weird gimmicks because he was none other than Steve Lombardi, perhaps WWE's greatest jobber ever, who had previously taken on the roles for the likes of the Red Knight, Kim Chi, Doink the Clown, and most famously, the Brooklyn Brawler. So throwing himself into this one with gusto then, Lombardi would start appearing on Raw in August, where, with a face painted up to look like a baseball and a carnival-like version of Take Me Out to the Ball Game for ring music, he would immediately start to rack up losses. Yes, it appears even McMahon didn't think much of the character, but that wasn't to say he didn't throw him a bone before it was all over, because in September, Schwartz would actually begin going on something of a winning streak defeating performers such as Louis Spicoli and PJ Black, all this before the baseball closure came to an end and WWE decided to pull the plug on the whole thing, returning Lombardi to his Brooklyn Brawler gimmick from there. Who knows, maybe if he'd had time to go a little further he could have main evented WrestleMania. Probably not though. That said, he was far from the only weird gimmick that year as 1994 would also see the debut of Duke the Dumpster Drossy a garbage man who'd signed up with WWE as a side hustle and, living the gimmick to its fullest, would carry a trash can to the ring with him, presumably so he could keep performing his day job while he wrestled? And Drossy, who was portrayed by journeyman wrestler Mike Drossy, would have a better time in the ring than Knuckleball Schwartz as it happened, because he would actually win his first match, pinning Barry Horowitz on the May 23rd episode of Raw. As well as this, he would technically be one of the originators of hardcore wrestling in WWE as, during a feud with Jerry Lawler throughout the course of that summer, Drossy would be struck across the head with his own trash can, giving birth to a spot that's lived on in every ECW-style match since. After that though, 1995 would prove to be a less successful year for the Garbage Man as the most noteworthy things he did would be to enter that year's Royal Rumble and King of the Ring, winning neither in the end. It wouldn't be until 1996, in fact, that he got something to sink his teeth into once more when he handed Hunter Hearst Helmsley his first loss in WWE after beating him by disqualification at that year's Royal Rumble, with this victory securing him the number 30 spot in the Rumble itself later that night. And while he would still fail to win that match, he would continue to feud with Helmsley for the next few months, at one point even facing him in a hair versus hair match where he would ultimately lose and be forced to shave off his locks. That however would be the end of the road for his run as during the summer of 96, Drossy would be released from his contract after deciding he couldn't keep up with the company's road schedule, with him disappearing from WWE TV from there all the way up until WrestleMania 17, at which point he would return to take part in the infamous gimmick battle royal. And of course, the man who eliminated him on that night was no stranger to 90s WWE either because he was arguably the most memorable weird gimmick of the whole era one who would be played by multiple people across his run, Doink the Clown. Yes, lots of kids are scared of clowns, so it only makes sense then to try and make a villain out of one. Look at the Joker after all, one of the most successful villains in all of fiction. 
and in terms of Vince McMahon's attempt, that would begin in 1992 when Doink, at this point being portrayed by Matt Osborne, would start appearing both in the crowd and at ringside so as to play tricks on both wrestlers and fans. Soon after this and he would make his in-ring debut, proving to be, despite his appearance, a pretty good wrestler, albeit one who wasn't below using things like tripwires and buckets of water to get an upper hand over opponents such as the big boss man, Tatanka, and Marty Jannetty. Eventually though, the evil clown would have to face off against his toughest challenge yet when, at WrestleMania 9, he would go one-on-one -on -one with Crush. And while it wasn't a walk in the park for him that night, he would end up getting the win after a second evil doink, this one played by Steve Kiern, the former Skinner, would come up from under the ring to interfere and help his doppelganger get the victory. So now that it was established that there was a full doink multiverse out there, this gradually helped to make him more and more of a hit with fans, with it all eventually leading to a babyface turn in September of 1993 after he'd set his sights on Jerry the King Lawler. Sadly though, at that point, Matt Bourne would be fired from the company as a result of drug issues, and this would mean that from then on, the character would be portrayed by a number of different people, none of whom were able to do it quite as well as the original. Still, with Ray Apollo taking up the mantle for the time being, things pushed forward anyway as Doink would pick up a miniature sidekick in the form of Dink and started going after every heel he could find, often pulling increasingly harmless pranks on them, ones that fit in with his new babyface alignment. And at one point, the Doink multiverse would expand even further when, during a 4 on 4 Survivor Series elimination match with Lawler, both he and Dink would be joined by two more family members, Wink and Pink. Not long after that though, with the character having mostly run its course, Doink would be reduced to the role of Jobber. And while this was going on, Matt Bourne would continue to play the character himself on the indie circuit taking it to places such as Midwest Territorial Wrestling and Extreme Championship Wrestling, where he would lean more heavily into the original darker outline for the gimmick. As for WWE though, when Doink eventually did return at the previously mentioned Gimmick Battle Royal at WrestleMania 17, he would again be portrayed by Ray Apollo. That said, Osborne would get to make one more appearance as the character in its original home in 2007, as it was on December 10th of that year that he would put on the clown makeup to take part in a battle royal on the Raw 15th anniversary episode. And since then, he's been brought back occasionally, usually being played by another wrestler like Chris Jericho disguising themselves so as to get one up on their opponent. As for Matt Osborne, he would actually try to reinvent the character on the indie circuit once more when, in 2010, he would bring it back, this time more heavily based on Heath Ledger's portrayal of the Joker in The Dark Knight. Yes, who would have thought that such a ridiculous gimmick would have such staying power, carrying on for years after it began and still being fondly remembered by many to this day. It's certainly a 180 from some of the other gimmicks of its era, one of which only got to make one on-screen appearance at all before being canned, that being Fantasio. Yes, few will remember Fantasio today, a wrestling mime slash magician who was introduced to audiences on the July 16th, 1995 episode of Wrestling Challenge. And here, in his solitary showing, the character, portrayed by Harry Del Rios, would wear a black and white mime mask to the ring which, when removed, revealed identical face paint underneath. From there, he would defeat his opponent Tony DeVito after magically pulling out his underwear and rolling him up for the three count. Yes, it wasn't exactly a gimmick with a lot of potential, and so it's probably for the best that it was dropped after this. But at least Fantasio got to have a match at all because for some other weird gimmicks they never even got this much. And of course, we're talking about one of the most infamous of them all here, the Gobbledygooker. Ah yes, the Gobbledygooker, hated, mocked, vilified. Outside of maybe the Shockmaster, there's never been a gimmick that debuted with such a wet fart. Of course, most of you know the story already. In the lead up to the 1990 Survivor Series, WWE had been hyping up the hatching of a giant egg, with fans at the time speculating on what was going to be inside. Perhaps it would be Ric Flair, perhaps it would be Sting, hell, The Undertaker who would debut on that very same show feared that it would be him at one point. In the end though, it would be Hector Guerrero in a poorly made turkey costume who, after emerging, immediately began making turkey noises as mean Gene Okerlund tried his best to salvage the whole disaster by dancing in the ring with him for a while. The live audience, however, were having none of this and so would boo the whole thing out of the building, 
with even the commentary team featuring Rowdy Roddy Piper and Gorilla Monsoon mocking it as it was happening. So you would think that after such an inauspicious debut, Vince McMahon would learn his lesson and pull the character, but things actually got worse from there as, while continuing to tour with the company in the weeks following, the Gooker would suffer another gaffe when, at a house show in Madison Square Garden, he would fall over trying to perform a handspring, with this only drawing further ire from the notoriously difficult to please New York crowd. So, shelving his plans to make the character a company mascot, the boss would pull his newest creation from live shows from there, with him not being seen after that until the previously mentioned Gimmick Battle Royal, where, with Hector Guerrero once again in the costume, he finally, technically, got to have a match. Since then, he's even returned for a few random cameos over the years, usually to mock how bad the idea had been in the first place. And one person who played him during this time was actually another notoriously weird gimmick, the Boogeyman. Yes, The Boogeyman stands out in particular because by the time he came around, it was a different era for WWE, one which placed a far heavier focus on athleticism and more realistic gimmicks. It was the era where people like Kurt Angle, Eddie Guerrero, and Chris Benoit were leading the pack over on SmackDown, so it almost felt like a throwback to the past then when, in July of 2005, vignettes would start hyping the upcoming debut of The Boogeyman a schlocky horror movie style villain who had been recently finding success over in WWE's developmental territory at the time, Ohio Valley Wrestling. And upon his debut on the blue brand, the character, portrayed by Martin Wright, would be portrayed as someone who was supposed to have featured in his own horror TV show, but after this had been abruptly cancelled, he was brought in by kayfabe network executive Palmer Cannon to wrestle instead. And instantly going full camp, the Boogeyman would start surprising wrestlers backstage by popping out of random places like closets and parked vans, all before chasing them off and screaming out his catchphrase, I'm the Boogeyman, and I'm coming to get ya! Not long after that, and he would make his in-ring debut when, on the December 2nd episode of SmackDown, he would defeat Simon Dean, further rubbing salt to the wound after the match when he took a handful of live worms and forced them into his opponent's mouth something which would become a recurring feature of his character going forward. And for as silly as all this was, fans at the time took to it as something a bit different from the rest of the show. This was what saw the Boogeyman eventually get into a full-blown feud with JBL, with him facing off against the Texan at the 2006 Royal Rumble and defeating him in under two minutes. Following this, Ann Wright would start a program with Booker T and his wife Charmel, as the five-time WCW champion here got to utilize his excellent comedy timing by constantly living in fear of an attack from his rival. And that would all eventually lead to a handicap match at WrestleMania 22, where the Boogeyman would once again pick up the win after kissing Charmel with a mouthful of worms. Yes, at a certain point, it felt like he had an Undertaker-like ability to beat everyone he came up against, and though his next feud would finally see him lose, it would also be here that he would introduce a mini version of himself as, while battling it out with Finley and Hornswoggle, fans would get their first chance to see Little Boogeyman. That gimmick would only end up being short-lived, however, as not long after this, the Boogeyman would be drafted over to the recently revamped ECW brand, where he would change up his look slightly and actually go on to team with CM Punk at one point, in a moment that feels like a parallel universe bleeding through to our own. Come 2009, though, the character would have run its course in WWE, and Wright would be released from his contract, with him from there taking it over to the indie circuit for the next few years, all before making a cameo return to WWE at the 2012 Slammy Awards. And since then, he's continued to make the odd appearance, showing up as recently as 2021 to scare Angel Garza so much that he would actually lose the 24-7 title to our truth Yes, given his longevity and winning record, you might be tempted to think of Martin Wright as the most successful wrestler to portray a weird gimmick, but that, of course, would mean discounting Glenn Jacobs. Okay, we're cheating a little bit here, because Jacobs' success started when he became Kane. Prior to this, though, he would struggle with a number of bizarre characters, ones which would include Unabomb, the fake Diesel, and perhaps most infamously of all, Dr. Isaac Yankum DDS. That's right, before there was Britt Baker, there was one wrestling dentist who ruled the roost, and that was Jerry Lawler's own personal one, who he decided to bring into WWE in June of 1995 to help him fight his ongoing battles with Bret Hitman Hart. 
and in his introductory segment, it became clear to fans what they were going to get as Yankum, whose name was taken from an old joke Bobby Heenan would tell, wasn't portrayed so much as a technical wizard who could keep up with the hitman in the ring, but more of a big monster who would pummel him if he got the chance. And while Glenn Jacobs certainly was a big guy, even he wasn't able to save this gimmick from being dead on arrival as, during a Superstars taping on August 15th of that year, he would lose to Hart by countout in his in-ring debut. So, hoping to recover some momentum then, Lawler's monster would square off against Hart again at that month's SummerSlam. Here though, he would fail once more, this time losing by disqualification after he'd hung his opponent from the top and middle ropes and refused to release him. Yes, it wasn't a good start for what was supposed to be a dominating giant, but he would get one more chance to redeem himself on the October 16th episode of Raw, when he faced off against the Hitman one more time, this time in a steel cage match. Unfortunately though, this would see him rack up his third straight loss to Brett. After that, there was no hope for him and, while he would limp on for a while, Isaac Yankum's days in WWE would be numbered as, after picking up notable losses to the likes of The Undertaker, Jake the Snake Roberts, Mark Merrow, and The Ultimate Warrior, the gimmick would be retired in September of the following year. But he wouldn't be the only failed gimmick that was retired around that time as, elsewhere on the show, Mike Halak had been having difficulties in trying to bring a mythical figure of Greek lore into the world of wrestling as he'd been busy portraying Mantar. Half man, half bull, or in reality, all man in a poorly made costume bull's head in what has to be one of the stupidest gimmicks in the history of the industry. Yes, while it was supposed to be imposing, when Mantar made his debut on the January 7th, 1995 episode of Superstars of Wrestling, fans couldn't help but laugh as he walked down to the ring with an oversized bull's head perched on top of his shoulders, one that was so large and unwieldy he couldn't actually get through the ropes without first taking it off. And while this meant a small mercy in that he wouldn't be forced to wrestle with it on, the image of a slightly schlubby guy mooing at and attempting to trample his opponents from there looked just about as ridiculous to the audience watching. That said, WWE clearly wanted to make the gimmick work as they would go as far as to assign Jim Cornette to be his manager, hoping that the Louisville native could use his verbal skills to get the whole thing over. In the end though, even Cornette couldn't talk that well and despite going on a small winning streak over a series of enhancement talents in the weeks that followed, Mantar would soon come up against the Intercontinental Champion at the time, Razor Ramon, losing to him there after Jeff Jarrett got involved. After that, Mantar entered the 1995 Royal Rumble and actually managed to last a full 9 minutes before getting eliminated but this would end up being a career highlight for him sadly as, from there, the purported Minotaur would lose to the likes of Bret Hart, Bob Sparkplug Holly, and Bam Bam Bigelow before the whole thing was dropped that summer. Yes, the mid-90s really felt like a terrible time for failed wrestlers with jobs gimmicks that would, at some point during the run, job to the hitman, but there are a couple more that came before that with perhaps the most notable of these two being the Repo Man, a, well, a Repo Man who would repossess the property of babyfaces after claiming they'd been unable to make their loan repayments quickly enough. And this character was actually played by Barry Darso, someone who had previously found fame in WWE as Smash, one half of Demolition. This new gimmick though would be met with less success as, wearing a ridiculous Zorro mask and jacket with tire marks on it that suggested he'd actually been run over while trying to repossess something, he would play the whole thing like he was a villain in the 60s Batman TV show. And shortly after his debut in late 1991, the Repo Man would be hired by Ted DiBiase to get his million dollar belt back from Virgil something which he ultimately succeeded in doing as, from there, he would next start a feud with the British Bulldog, that saw him controversially hang his opponent from the ropes with a tow rope at one point. After that, he would move on to a lighter, more comedic program when he stole the Macho Man's hat, with the suggestion here being that the former WWE Champion had bought his headwear on finance. Regardless of his financial situation though, Savage would get his revenge when he eliminated the Repo Man at the 1993 Royal Rumble, with the gimmick being dropped soon thereafter. But as we said, there's one more notable wacky gimmick that appeared around this time as, in the August of 1992, fans had also been introduced to Max Moon, a wrestling… spaceman? Uh, alien? We're still not quite sure to be honest. And what made this one notable was that originally, it was meant to be played by legendary Lucha Libre star Conan. 
That was until, after a disagreement with management about how he would be portrayed, Conan decided to cut bait, leaving WWE to have to scramble to find a replacement in the form of Paul Diamond, a Croatian journeyman wrestler who had worked around the territory system for years prior to that. And while we're sure he was great in his prior roles, it was hard for anyone to get Max Moon over as a serious threat, adorned as he was in ring gear that was supposed to make him look like Tron, but ended up making him more closely resemble the intro to Saved by the Bell. As well as this, his ring entrance would see him wear not only a jetpack, but two wrist devices that shot out fireworks too, in a pretty unintimidating move. And to make matters worse, when the bell rang, despite picking up a couple of disqualification wins over the likes of Rick Martel, his most notable moment would come when he lost to Shawn Michaels on the debut episode of Monday Night Raw, with his time drawing to a close soon after that, as by February of 1993, the gimmick would be mercifully dropped. Yes, it seems that not all gimmicks are created equal after all. But, while some of the weirder ones we've looked at today weren't exactly what you would call a success, it's hard to argue that ones like Doink the Clown and the Boogeyman didn't exceed expectations, with this proving that there are no bad parts for an actor, and that it's all really about what you do with the role you're given. Even if that role is… Buzz Lightyear? Seriously, what was Max Moon? Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow WrestleWithAndy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.